Welcome to another video here at Whiteboard Doctor. We appreciate you checking it out. Topic for today is going to be kind of a denser medical education topic targeting those in medicine. Obviously, we encourage anybody who is interested to check out the video, but just know it's going to be a little bit of a denser medical education topic rather than one of those general uh, videos that we do that might be of particular interest to the larger public rather than those in medicine itself. Flow starvation is the topic for today. Uh, we're not going to do an introduction to ventilator scalers, which are these, the pressure scaler, flow scaler, and volume scaler, because we actually covered that in a previous video, which we'll link in the video description. It's this video here, ventilator waveforms, scalers and loops, basic concepts, pressure, flow, and volume. So if you need that introductory video or a brush up on that, definitely check out that initial video that'll be linked below. We'll also link it in the top right corner right now. You can check that out and then hop back over here. Oh, we skipped to the punchline. Hop back over here for a discussion on flow starvation. Quick 30 second break for our introduction. Don't go anywhere though. We'll hop right into flow starvation. Hello everyone and welcome to another video here at Whiteboard Doctor. Thanks for joining us today. Here at Whiteboard Doctor, our mission is to provide you with free, interesting, relevant, understandable medical education and news for all types of lifelong learners, trainees, and practitioners. We have weekly videos that we debut Fridays at 5 p.m. Eastern Time with bonus medical education videos posted throughout the week. We'd love for you to join the Whiteboard Doctor community and follow along by hitting the subscribe button located in the bottom right-hand corner. We also encourage all likes and comments, even if it is just to say hello. All our video descriptions contain links for additional related videos that might be interesting, so don't forget to check those out. And lastly, a quick disclaimer, none of these videos are intended to be acted upon as medical advice. Please pause the video here and read this disclaimer its entirety before moving on. With no further ado, stay well, keep learning, and let's get to the video. All right, thanks for sticking around. So flow starvation is a type of ventilator desynchrony, and it's one that can cause problems with patients. Number one, patients clearly are not getting what they want from the ventilator. They're flow starved. So we, as the ones who set those settings on the ventilator, uh, are not giving the patient what they're trying to get from the ventilator. So it's uncomfortable for the patient. In addition to that, it can cause a degree of respiratory compromise, especially if it gets more significant. So what is flow starvation? To start, we have three different waveforms here. Of note, we're going to be talking about flow starvation uh, from the ventilator settings of volume control. So VC, AC is how it's set on some vents, but volume control rather than pressure control, meaning you set the volume the patient is going to receive. And what volume control normal scalers or waveforms look like are set right here and drawn out. This is the pressure scaler, right? So you have this set pressure, the PEEP, and the ventilator increases the pressure as they're getting a breath. It kind of flans out here and continues to increase as they're getting a breath. Breath is done, it goes down to the set PEEP, which is the lowest pressure, the end expiratory pressure, and then a new breath starts. So each one of these is a breath, and that's a normal pressure scaler in someone in volume control. Here's the flow scaler. Flow goes up, pauses, flow goes down, normalizes, up, pauses, down, normalizes, and this is one breath as well. And then the volume scaler makes intuitive sense. Volume goes up, volume starts to go down, back to zero. And this is in regards to time. So the horizontal axis here is time. Again, check out that previous video, the introduction to basic scalar concepts. If this is confusing to you, if you're like, I'm good, I understand these things, then continue on in this video. What happens to the scalars or waveforms during flow starvation? Because that is how you diagnose flow starvation is by looking particularly at the pressure scalar. So what happens in flow starvation to the pressure scaler is you have your normal, you know, this is your just peep, there's no breath. The patient has a slight negative dip in their pressure scaler, meaning they're initiating a breath, right? They're sucking in, they're causing a negative intrathoracic pressure. So you often see the pressure dip just a little negative. Then they get their breath. And during this area where the pressure usually flattens out, what happens is they actually start to get this negative kind of dip and then the pressure will go up again and come down. Compare that to here where you have this smooth line and then think about it conceptually. What is this negative dip? 
Well, this is a pressure scalar, right? So anything that's going down means the pressure is going down. And when someone is initiating a breath, they're sucking in, right? Breathing in, their diaphragms contract and they have negative intrathoracic pressure. That's how their lungs inflate. And what's happening in flow starvation, and you can think about this, you can picture this, is that the patient's respiratory effort, that negative intrathoracic pressure that results from them inspiring, outpaces the flow that is filling up the lungs and being delivered. So negative, they start to take a breath, breath starts to be pumped in, but they are inhaling faster than the flow is being delivered. So you see this kind of negative inflection as the flow is being delivered, and then the breath's done and it goes back to normal. This can get pretty severe, you know, it can get to the point where, I don't know why I'm writing above the thing, but next breath, it can get to the point where this can come way down before it goes back up. And this here would be flow starvation. The flow is not keeping pace with how fast they want the flow, so they are having a negative intrathoracic pressure because they're breathing in. They're, you know, sucking in through that endotracheal tube into their lungs. Their diaphragms are contracting and it's happening faster than the flow is being delivered, which is why you get this negative deflection in the pressure scalar. The flow and volume scalars don't tend to really look any different, right? Because the flow is what's being delivered. This is just the flow that's being delivered on the ventilator and the volume is the volume that they're receiving. So that will still look the same. What will look different is the pressure scaler because their inspiratory effort, the negative intrathoracic pressure they're prompting with their own breath is outpacing the amount of flow being delivered. And if that flow is being delivered more quickly, you'd see they'd have a negative deflection, it'd come up and now they're getting enough flow until the breath's done. So you don't get that negative inspiratory pressure because their, their lungs are filling up with air fast enough to keep up with their own negative inspiratory pressure, their negative inspiratory force. So that's what the scalar will look like. That's how you diagnose flow starvation. Instead of a nice kind of flat line here, you're going to get this negative dip. And it can be to different extents from a slight, you know, negative to a very significant negative dip. So what do we do about flow starvation then? Well, flow starvation, again, in volume control mode, flow is essentially a product of the volume that's being delivered at a certain rate, right? So if your tidal volume that you set on volume control, let's just say is 500 cc's, the flow is going to be related to how fast that 500 cc's is being delivered, which makes sense, right? Because you're pushing in 500 cc's of air and the flow is going to be the pace in which that 500 cc's is pushed in through the ventilator endotracheal tube into their lungs. And that on most events is going to be then related to the inspiratory time, which we'll just say, let's say it's one second. So then the flow is going to be a product of the fact that you're pushing 500 cc's of air into their lung over one second. All right, normal is about 50 to 60 liters per minute of flow. And again, it's dependent on the tidal volume and the inspiratory time, the eye time. And you can picture how this might change, right? So the example we used above is their tidal volume is 500 cc's and their inspiratory time they get that tidal volume is one second. Now picture if we change that to 0.8 seconds, would they get more or less flow? Think about that for a second. So you're getting 500 cc's of tidal volume, right? So we'll say 500 milliliters over one second in that initial one. So this is gonna be, you can see 500 milliliters a second of flow. Whereas if you did 500 milliliters of air, over 0.8 seconds, let's see if I have anything near me that I can do math on, I should have planned ahead for that. Here's, a, here's my phone, the handheld calculator. You guys who are smart probably already did this in your head, but 500 milliliters over 0.8 seconds, this is going to be 625, oops, 625 milliliters of air 
over one second. So the flow is going to be higher because you decrease the I time, which is the time in which that breath is delivered. In addition to that, think about this third example down here. What if you increase the tidal volume to 600 milliliters, but you still delivered it over one second? Well, as you're probably picking up on, that would be 600 milliliters of tidal volume delivered over one second, which would equal 600 milliliters per second of flow. So solutions to flow starvation on the ventilator involve either increasing your tidal volume, right? If you go from 500 cc's to 600 cc's over the same one second, your flow is going to go up from 500 cc's per second to 600 cc's per second. Or you can decrease the inspiratory time, the I time, the time in which that breath is delivered, which we showed here, right? You're keeping 500 cc's, but you're delivering it over 0.8 seconds. So then the flow increases to 625 cc's per second. But what if you don't want to do that? And that's why this is a uh, clinical scenario dependent. So let's say that you have a person who is severe ARDS, severe acute respiratory distress syndrome. And we've covered ARDS a number of times. It's linked in our critical care playlist. We'll link it in the video description as well. And you want to make sure this patient is just getting six cc's of tidal volume per ideal body weight, per kg. That's one of the kind of ARDS endpoints, six cc's per kg of tidal volume or less, depending on the clinical scenario. So you don't want to increase their tidal volume, all right? And let's say for some reason you don't want to increase their inspiratory time. You think this is their lung protective ventilation. Well, you can consider then increasing their sedation or even doing neuromuscular blockade paralytic to decrease the patient's respiratory effort so that they no longer are inciting such an inspiratory effort that outpaces the flow that you're delivering the patient. And it, it really depends on the clinical scenario. Obviously, increasing sedation or doing a neuromuscular blockade paralytic is not something you want to just reach for, for no reason just to make them look less flow starved, right? Those are big decisions that can affect patient outcomes. So that's kind of last ditch effort. If they're in a clinical scenario where you are being uh, you're kind of in a tight spot on the ventilator and you can't adjust things. The ventilator adjustments that will help this patient are increasing their tidal volume or decreasing their inspiratory time um, to try to get that normal 50 to 60 liters per minute of flow or whatever that patient is needing. Uh, typically, if they're on an, an appropriate tidal volume, you know, let's say they're around 6 cc's per kg, I tend to try to decrease the I time first. Let's say the I time set at one second. I'll try decreasing it to 0.8 seconds or even go less than that and see if that gets rid of their flow starvation. It usually will. And if they tolerate that, okay, I'll leave that as is. If not, and if I think they will be all right with high, a higher tidal volume for lung protective strategy reasons, uh, you can increase their tidal volume as well. And then in your back pocket, increasing sedation or uh, paralytics, if the clinical scenario for other reasons demands it, will also probably help their flow starvation. But always start with ventilator adjustments being increase the flow they're receiving by decreasing their inspiratory time or even increasing their tidal volume. All right, so that is flow starvation. We're actually going to go through some other ventilator desynchronies in upcoming videos here, uh, such as double triggering and that type of thing. So don't uh, miss those. We will link them all in the video description. They're also going to all be in our kind of critical care playlist. Uh, we could probably find it quick. Well, uh, oh, we actually have it linked here. Critical care playlist. And we have a bunch of critical care content uh, linked in that playlist if you're interested. So check that out. Again, linked in the video description. Let us know what thoughts, comments, questions you have down below. We appreciate you all. Subscribe, hit the bell button, all that good stuff. And in any case, stay well, keep learning, and we will see you all next time.